Uh, it's such an honor to speak after uh, Radia. Uh, she's like one of my heroes, and Muakana is definitely doing, um, you know, an amazing work in extremely harsh uh, circumstances. Uh, so I really salute you, Radia. You know, I love you. Um, so thank you uh, for the Committee to Protect Journalists uh, for inviting me and the Gulf Center as well. I really appreciate taking part in this event, despite that uh, it's a very difficult topic for me. It was very difficult to gather my thoughts for this talk, not only because of the situation in Yemen for my family, my friends, and my people, um, is beyond any worse humanitarian situation you can imagine of, but also because how can I talk about public freedoms without focusing much on the humanitarian catastrophe? So as we speak today, uh, the numbers of killed people in Yemen because of the consequences of the devastation and damage of the war is in a constant rise. Cholera alone is killing one person per an hour, and thus we have one funeral per an hour. And still, the tears and pain at these funerals are not heard by those who have the decision to end the war. Before I speak further, on the inhuman and absolute dire situation in Yemen, and also while keeping in mind that we are here today to understand how the war impacted public freedoms, I would like to start by sharing a short story of a young man called Amjad Muhammad Abdurrahman. So with his thin and crispy body, Amjad, the 23 years old young man who's also a law student in Aden City, he had a vision to make a change in his city. He was well known for his cultural initiatives in town and his critique against extremism, especially the extremism that is thriving on, under the ongoing multi-front war in Yemen. So according to Amjad's close friends, Amjad received repeatedly death threats and was abducted earlier this year by some extremist group on the pretext uh, of Amjad was promoting atheism. And following some intervention by influential armed political leaders, Amjad was released. And after this, Amjad got back to the cultural scene and uh, a couple months later, he had, uh, a couple days later, he had a public event titled Accepting the Other. And not long after this, Exactly last month, like today, a couple of veiled and armed men stormed into an internet cafe where Amjad was at and shot him both in the chest and face. Amjad was killed immediately. The following day, the extremists did not only ban holding a funeral for Amjad, supposedly because he was an atheist, but also they detained four of Amjad's friends who mostly work as journalists as they were about to leave Amjad's house. One of these four young men who got detained uh, is a colleague of mine. The friends were detained for one day in which were expo exposed to severe physical torture. And I had the chance to hear the heartbreaking deta details of that torture from my colleague. The young men were released after, again, an intervention of influential armed political leaders. And I can go on and continue telling about other heartbreaking stories of killed and survival victims, but time is tight, and Amjad's story is a one drop in an ocean of horrendous attacks and killings against journalists, activists, and ordinary citizens who happen to be at the wrong place at the wrong time. This is my third year to speak at the Council on the crackdown on, uh, um, on freedom and of expression and press in Yemen in light of Yemen war. And I can assure you that the crackdown has new faces today. After we used to know that the Houthis were the greatest abuser of or how the Saudi-led coalition was leading a media blackout on Yemen war, today the three years long war in yemen has produced new armed militias and extremists who are also leading the crackdown so now today's event is much focused on public freedoms and i really get a headache when i think about uh, i think of that 
Because how can we talk about freedoms when the public is in a life or death situation? And actually, it's in a death or death situation. So by the UN humanitarian chef's account today, the largest humanitarian crisis worldwide is in Yemen. And I would also say that the largest disgrace for humanity today is what's happening to millions of people in Yemen. And how could, how could we, mankind, in 2017, allow a man-made disaster rip the lives of thousands and thousands of people? The inaction by the international community and the world's silence to the suffering of millions of human beings in Yemen is baffling to me. Sadly, millions of Yemeni's options are limited. They are trapped in war with no access to flee the conflict, with no food, no water, no medicine, no shelter, and no nothing. And they are left to die in slow death. As you probably know, Yemen has all already been the poorest Arab country for many years before the war started. And that means today that almost the entire population are too poor to flee, too weak to shout, and too exhausted to plead. The war has devastated the already poor country. The war has also devastated everything you can imagine of. Freedom of expression, freedom of press, the right to food, the right to live in dignity, the right to dream for a better tomorrow. And above all, it has devastated Yemeni's trust in humanity. As the warring sides, meaning the Saleh Houthi wing and the Saudi-led coalition and President Hadi wing, as they are all still fighting on who will have the biggest chunk of the cake, death is ri ripping Yemeni lives in multi ways. In Yemen today, if the Saudi-led coalition airstrike or the Houthi and Saleh bombs and mines or the extremist bullets or the torture at prisons or the epidemic diseases or food sacrosity, if all these did not kill you, in Yemen today people are committing suicide. Three weeks ago, a lady in Ib city, in my late grandfather's city, the lady poisoned herself and her two daughters and committed suicide as the mother had nothing and could not go begging for help. And there are many other you know, uh, stories of people committing suicides in the light of the situation in Yemen. So amidst of all this death madness, I sometimes wonder if these warring parties uh, are fighting over who gets the biggest share of the cake. I wonder what is it that they would rule if the nation is totally wiped out. I also wonder how all these reports don't make weapon supplier countries like the US, UK, and other rethink or at least investigate how their weapons sold to the Saudi-led coalition are used in Yemen war. To sum up, I'm not here today to give you the, st the statistics and numbers of how many journalists or activists or civilians were killed or injured or expected to be killed. I'm here to tell you that Yemeni people are so tired tired from the international community broken promises of sending aid which only 10 or 20 percent only reached them. Yemenis are tired of the international community in action and speeding up any peace talks that could end the war. And more importantly, Yemeni people are so tired of this piece of cake which the warring parties fight over at the expense of innocent Yemenis lives and future. But I'm not tired. And I speak now not as a journalist or a Yemeni citizen or an activist. I speak here as a human being who is enraged by the amount of injustices Yemenis have to endure. I'm enraged seeing how in some countries animals are much better treated than how Yemenis are treated. I'm not tired of speaking up and so must this council unless the Human Rights Council want to be at the wrong side of history and betray every value it proclaims to advocate for. I refuse to be tired because even if I were not Yemeni, I will speak up for these people because I think Yemenis deserve justice and live in dignity just like me and you. Thank you. <laughs>